You're listening to the Healthy Creative Ministry Podcast with Matt Curtis. This is the podcast that helps you take your creative ministry from wherever you are today to healthy and effective. Why should my church care about creative ministry? This is week two of me answering this question. Last week, I addressed the theological arguments as to why your church should care about creative ministry. This week, I want to talk about more of a practical approach. I'm not going to say pragmatic because I think that pragmatism is one of the problems that exists in our culture, and you've heard more about that from last week's episode. But I think I want to use the word practical because it is unreasonable for us to completely dismiss a practical argument for these things. If we are simply living in an idealistic world, we're ignoring the reality of our day-to-day. If you're trying to reach somebody who is not physically present, you're going to have to do a little bit of work in order to get them. Now, In today's culture, we have new opportunities that we didn't have before. You know, Paul's day, he had to write a letter. And then he had to have somebody send the letter or like carry the letter, like walk it to them or run or whatever. Like there was work that had to be done to get a message to somebody. Today, the barrier is lower, but we still have to do some degree of work. When it comes to communicating effectively about opportunities to grow for those inside the church and communicating effectively externally to those who are not yet followers of Jesus, we need to understand the language that's being spoken in our culture. And I'm not making a distinction here between those inside and outside when it comes to the language that our culture speaks. Because the reality is that the largest companies on planet Earth are warring for the attention of the people sitting in your auditorium, your sanctuary, your worship center, whatever you call it, your theater seats or your pews, they are the ones that these major companies are targeting and they're trying to get as much attention as possible. These companies, the Facebooks, the TikToks, all of these organizations are focused on one thing, stealing the attention of your congregation. So as we talk about these things a little bit more practically this week, as opposed to the theological perspectives presented last week, understand that your congregation is in the thick of it just like those outside the church. I think it's really important that we recognize that our culture speaks a visual language. Look at so much of what you're consuming on a day-to-day basis. You're consuming movies, uh, video games, uh, TV shows, commercials, social media. Social media platforms are moving away from text-driven content and toward video-driven content. Open up any of the apps that you frequent and you will be hard pressed to not find video. I'm even seeing this on X where it's a primarily short text statement driven platform. And yet a lot of times there's video content there. It's just the way that our culture is moving. And so if you have the capacity as a pastor to be creating these things in, in this medium, then that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. The reality, though, is that most pastors need a degree of assistance when it comes to creating this way. I'll take that a step further. I think that you're actually going to be distracted from the ministry that you're called to if you are also focusing on the media creation side. This is really something that bringing somebody in or or leveraging a person on the outside, however you structure it, working alongside someone that can partner with your ministry for the purpose of of creating content that speaks the language that our culture speaks is a very valuable thing to add to your team. When we look at how our culture communicates, it's such a visually driven culture. I call it the language of our culture. So the the way that I think about this is a little bit like missions. Let's say that there's a people group that you are tasked with reaching. Well, the first thing that you're gonna have to do is you're gonna have to learn their language, right? The example I always use here is, let's say that the president declares that the national language of our country was French. Well, there'd probably be a bunch of arguing about it, but at the end of the day, in order for you to have the highest chance possible of being heard by the people around you, you're going to have to learn French. You're going to have to learn the language that our people speak My dad taught at a seminary in the Netherlands as I was growing up on his sabbaticals. So we would go as a family. Every time we would visit a different country, we would have this little family meeting where we would talk about what are some of the common phrases that would be valuable for us to know so that we can communicate at a very basic level 
with the people that we're interacting with. Most of the time, the only phrases that we learned were something like, where's the bathroom? And do you speak English? But ultimately, what we were trying to do is we were trying to recognize that there is a language spoken here, and we need to be able to interface with that language just enough to be able to maybe even ask them to speak a different language. So I remember we were pulling into uh, Paris, and I remember sitting on the train. Parlez-vous anglais, s'il vous plaît? Parlez-vous anglais, s'il vous plaît? Do you speak English? <laughs> Please, do you speak English? What we're trying to do is we're trying to acknowledge and really honor the fact that they speak a language there. We don't want to go in as Americans and just say, oh, we don't speak French, you know, speak English. That, that, that's a rude way to encounter a culture. And so with the value of respecting the group of people that are there, the native tongue of the culture, we wanted to do a little bit of work on our end to, to reach them, to, to be able to interact with them. I look at churches and I think to myself, if we're not willing to do any work to reach our culture, I feel like we're missing the boat on the Great Commission. I'm not saying that you have to be an all evangelism, all the time type of organization. But I am saying if you don't do some of the work to bridge the gap, then culture will never be able to understand the message of the gospel that you're communicating. I believe this is a very important step that we need to be taking as churches because we need to speak in a language that our culture understands. There's no spirituality tied to this. Look, if you want to talk to somebody, you need to understand how they talk. You need to understand the culture in which they operate. You need to understand the language that they speak. If you're not willing to do any of those things, then ultimately you're saying, I don't care if this group of people, here's what I have to say. If you're not willing to learn the language so that you can promote a car that you like, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> but we're talking about the message of the gospel. We're talking about people who do not know Christ. If you're not willing to do the work of learning the language of our culture so that you can proclaim the gospel, I just don't understand why we're disregarding the Great Commission in such a, a overt way. We can do this. We can lean in to learning the language that our culture speaks. And for the sake of the gospel, it's worth it. Practically speaking, internally, there's value in us elevating the importance of creative ministry. We have so many things going on often that it's hard for those in our congregation to understand what the best next step is for them, what options are available to them even sometimes. There are plenty of times where I hear churches talk about the fact, oh, nobody's, nobody understands what's going on here. Nobody can, you know, they, they miss events because they can't, they can't figure out what's happening. Those are communication problems. Those are really it's organization of information problems. And that's what happens in, in the communications side of this umbrella of creative ministry. The goal here is to organize information and communicate it in a way so that people inside know what their next step is. If we're not doing that, then we're making it harder for people to take their next step really of growth and, and potentially even maturity when it comes to their own spiritual walk. Strategic communication helps information be heard. It evaluates what communication channels are worthwhile, what communication channels are effective, and what type of information should go in which communication channel. So a lot of times we'll be investing a lot of energy and effort in putting the wrong message on a channel. A great story that I heard about this years ago, there was an organization that was focused on reaching a, an inner city youth group. So there's a specific demographic they were trying to reach. And so they built a Facebook group and they were running Facebook ads and they were really, really pushing hard into this. And they were just getting no response, none at all. I mean, like a couple people responded, but for the effort that they put in, absolute failure. <laughs> it just was not going well. One of the people who worked in this organization uh, reached out to one of the people that they were trying to reach. Essentially, they, they were connected to these groups in terms of the serving that they were doing with them. And they asked them, say, what is going on? We have done so much work to build out Facebook to be exactly what would be beneficial for you guys. And it just seems like nobody's interested. And his response was, 
pretty straightforward. Facebook, oh yeah, none of us are on Facebook. We're all still on MySpace. Oh. So this organization put in a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money, and a lot of strategy, and, and they didn't ask the most fundamental question, which is where even are our people? These are the types of problems that we'll encounter when we don't have somebody on our team or someone in our organization, doesn't have to be a paid staff member, but someone who's helping us think about these things. Where should we be putting certain information? What are the communication channels that we have access to or that we should leverage? Those are the elements that need to be addressed and it all ties back to speaking visual language. Now I know a lot of times that the evangelism or the outside of our church side of things is, is sort of like, well, you know, I guess, but our people should be taking care of that. Well, this applies internally as well. Effective communication helps you shepherd your people better. There's a strong connection between shepherding and communications. For me, it can be boiled down to as simple as what I mentioned before. If I tell you about a particular class that I think will be beneficial for you and you don't attend it, that's the decision that you're making with regards to whether or not this is the right next step for you. But if you never know about this class, if you can never figure out the offerings or the things that are coming up because we can't communicate it in a way that's effective to you, <laughs> or relative to the last story, we're posting about it on Facebook and you're still on MySpace, I, that's a really big problem. It's going to stall out growth in your organization, not numerically, potentially that as well, but more importantly, that's going to stall out the spiritual growth of the people that are in your ministry, the people that you are shepherding, the congregation that you are called to care for, to equip for the work of the gospel. So you're now thwarted in the call that you have as the leader of the organization because something as simple as you can't get the information to the right people in terms of what the, the helpful next step for growth is for them. Ultimately, your congregation has a lot of opportunities to spend their time. They're not sitting around thinking to themselves, oh, I wonder if the church has more things that I should be doing. There may be a few in your congregation that are thinking that way, but that is abnormal. That is not the normative mindset of the people in the congregation. Most of them are actually battling for time to be able to do anything tied to the organization. If you're not helping them understand why investing their time this way in your events, in your ministries, in whatever it is that you're putting on, if you're not helping them connect those dots, they're not going to see the value. They're just not. I hear this all the time when it comes to announcements. Oh, you should attend this thing. It's going to be fun. Okay, well, if it's going to be fun, I'm not interested. What? Why wouldn't you be interested? Because staying at home in my sweatpants is fun. <laughs> Watching a movie is fun. Going mini golfing is fun. There are a lot of things in life that are fun. If that's your, if that's your argument as to why I should be involved in your ministry, well, I'll just choose lower friction ways of doing that. And that's the problem with a lot of this stuff when we're not recognizing we need to be connecting the mission, the vision, the, the impact or the growth that's going to happen through this event. And so as you get better at those things, you're leaning more and more into creative ministry, specifically communications in this example. But those are the kinds of things that you have to be attentive to if you're hoping that your people will be moving in a really positive direction when it comes to growth when it comes to engagement into your ministry, ultimately spiritual maturity, that's the net result of it. And the reason I say that is because your congregation is living in a world that is battling for those things. And so you may feel like that's not a tactic that you like. Okay, great. I don't love it either, but it is the reality of our world. If you ignore the fact that their attention is being competed for by these major companies, these major organizations, these major businesses that are trying to gather engagement and attention as much as they possibly can, if you don't recognize that you're competing with them, then you're going to lose. And, and it's not that you have to be better than them. It's simply that you have to understand this is now the language that your congregation speaks. With social media algorithm, feeding them things that will keep them addicted to their platform. That is literally the design of these platforms. They're trying to capture the attention of your congregation so that they are only invested 
in that platform because then they can serve them ads and then they can make more money. That's the battle. I don't know how you're going to compete with that if you don't at least acknowledge that this visual language of our culture is real. You have to figure out ways to communicate effectively to this group of people. When we disregard the fact that the largest companies on earth are battling for the attention of our congregation, we're doing them a great disservice. We won't get any attention if we don't put in some effort. And I don't want attention for my own sake. I don't want attention for your church for your own sake. I want your church to have attention because your church is the only hope that your congregation has for taking positive steps in their walk. Because social media is not going to be doing that. TikTok isn't sitting around saying, hey, how do we help this group of people move further in their spiritual walk? How do we help them grow in maturity? TikTok doesn't care. TikTok wants them to be investing their time so that TikTok can sell them advertisements. That's it. That's all that they care about. If we just dismiss these things as not important, then we are not helping our congregation at all. If anything, we're simply allowing them to fall into the trap that social media is for them. This is how I would answer the question, why should my church care about creative ministry? Thanks for listening to this episode of the Healthy Creative Ministry Podcast. This podcast is just one of the ways Lunchtime Heroes can help you build a healthy creative ministry in your church. Stay up to date on the latest by signing up for the Creative Bites email at lunchtimeheroes.co. 